Hi, Josie. Hello, Rosemary. Let me just start my video and make sure I've got the right camera working. <laughs> um, no, okay. Yes, I think that's the right camera. And can you hear me? I can hear you perfectly, Josie, yeah. Because uh, right. I've had my headset on all day while I've been listening to everybody uh, else. Uh, and I thought, oh no, I won't, I won't use it for mine. Um, but then I have fun and games getting the audio and the video right. <laughs> It's, it's perfect. It's perfect. Yeah. Excellent. You don't need the Princess Leia look. Sorry? You don't need the Princess Leia look. Not, no, not today. I quite like that, actually. I do quite like it because it means you can actually leave your desk. You can walk elsewhere and still listen. Um, but yes, I just thought, yes, get rid of that today now. I'm just going to um, use it. It's actually a new camera. So um, it's pretty crisp. Yeah. Excellent. That's good news. So if you can see me and you can hear me, that's a good start, isn't it? <laughs> anyway, so um, I'm just going to introduce Josie with her sparkling, sparkling camera. <laughs> oh, I love you, Josie. OK, our final guest this afternoon is Josie Whiteley of Dual Communication, who will be talking about connecting with your clients, something that is I think I said earlier, absolutely crucial. I, I think I was reading recently that we're talking recently about the thing that makes a real difference in, in any kind of therapy is the bond that you create with a client more than the therapy that you're doing. Absolutely. Yeah. And I shall be interested to, to when you've heard what I've got to say, Rosemary, I'll be interested to, to hear what you think. <laughs> so, um, Josie worked as a journalist for a decade before becoming a lecturer, a college manager and leader. Um, she has a master's degree in, degree in communication and created her business, Dual Communication, in 2014 and now delivers training in areas such as ethical leadership and wellbeing. And I know that is so important to you, Josie, isn't it? The whole kind of working ethically and managing and leading organisations in an ethical manner. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Josie is also a coach for Leeds Beckett University School Mental Health Award and in her spare time <laughs> is Vice Chair of the National Education Union's Leadership Council, that is a mouthful, and a trustee of two, which charities are you a trustee of Josie? I'm a trustee of a local charity, Enrich Charity, which I actually set up and that supports um, arts uh, in the town I live in. And um, the other um, place is the Meditation Centre in Dent, in Cumbria. Um, and I've been a trustee there for about seven years. And that's a, when we're not in COVID times, it's a wonderful place to go and visit and just meditate and just take some time out and enjoy the beautiful space. Um, so I will share the, their website at the end, actually. That would be great, actually. Because, it, yeah, it has some great courses on there and is, um, it's a lovely thing to be involved with uh, and not have any pressure on myself to deliver because I don't teach there being a trustee. It's that sort of hands off role, but still involved. And it's, it's just wonderful. Great. Well, I'm going to um, hand over you to, to you now, Josie. Um, I'll put your website links in the chat for people. Um, any comments, any questions, please obviously put them in the chat. Or you can put them in the Q&A or in the comments on Facebook, even if you're not watching the live live. And I'm sure Josie will come back to you as well if you've got any questions when you're watching it later. Yeah. Um, and yeah, Josie, if you put those other contacts for Dent as well about the meditation centre, that would be fantastic. Yes, I'll do that. Brilliant. OK, shall I make a start? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I, I'm always a little bit worried about going uh, going last, um, but I have to say I'm really sort of geared up for this this afternoon because I've listened to all the other presentations throughout the day and they've just been so fabulous. And it's been really lovely to hear therapists and doctors talking about some of the same areas I'm going to be talking about in my session about connecting with your clients. And I hope it will help to bring everything together. Um, that we've that we've learned for those of us who've attended all today's sessions. Um, I have left some time after my presentation for um, questions and answers. Please feel free to put any comments, any questions in the chat um, or comments if you're on Facebook. 
So thank you, Rosemary, for that lovely introduction. Um, for those of you listening today who don't know me, um, I have worked mainly in education and the media, so I've got both public sector and private sector experience. But in 2014, I made the decision to be self-employed and I've done um, interim management work in colleges and consultancy work in universities and schools, amongst other things. So I'm perhaps coming to some of today's topics from a slightly different angle from some of our other presenters. Since I was a child, I've always had a thing about fairness and wanting to do the right thing. And my move into self-employment kind of came about naturally because I suddenly realized, I woke up one day and thought, I've got 30 years of knowledge and experience here that, that I could actually share with others. Um, and I've had lots of experience of very good leadership of how I'm being led and managed, but also a lot of experience of not so good leadership. So I decided I wanted to share this. And before we had COVID to face, I used to deliver workshops at conferences um, or staff development sessions in workplaces. So I was disappointed when that had to come to a temporary halt. But the opportunity for me in that is that I've had to get familiar with Zoom and Teams and, and all those um, different types of connecting media. And to learn how to translate what I do to on-screen work. Um, so one of the things that I think is vitally important to all therapists, um, well, actually to everybody, not just all therapists, uh, I'm saying that because we're talking to an audience, um, perhaps of some Think Tree members, but anybody could be listening in uh, to this today. And what I want you to think about is the importance of good relationships, because they're key in the workplace and they're also key in our personal lives and those relationships can only grow from a place of effective communication and that then leads to a positive connection and this is true whether this is in business or pleasure. Um, my business name actually Jaw Communication um, came out of my initials and also out of my belief in the vital importance of communication in every transaction we ever carry out. And as a journalist and a teacher and a leader, I've really needed to be a good communicator. So I will attempt to share my screen now, hopefully. This is sometimes where it goes horribly wrong. So let's just see if we can get something to happen. Oh, there we go. So what I'm gonna talk about today is about connecting with your clients. And in the context of a global pandemic, what have we learned over these last 16 or 17 months? And I think that most people have learned the true value and the importance of relationships with family, with friends, with work colleagues and with clients. And we've also come to value other relationships, perhaps rather unexpectedly. You know, I, I've enjoyed chatting to my um, Tesco delivery man. Um, and there are other people like post office workers, carers, um, volunteers and staff working in NHS and so on that we owe an awful lot to. And when we've come across them, you know, when I've had reason to perhaps ring the GP surgery um, or my dental surgery, the person I'm speaking to, the receptionist, I've thanked them for being there and working through the pandemic because it's been a very strange time and we've we've developed other relationships that we haven't perhaps previously got because of that. Um, in a lot of the examples I've just given there, like post office workers, carers, volunteers, we actually are the customers. Um, and when we're treated in a respectful way, in a friendly way, then we usually would have a positive response to that experience. So this afternoon, I want you to think about how you can ensure that your behaviours always enable your customers and clients to have a truly positive experience, which will hopefully mean that if it's the kind of arena where you'd expect them to return, that they will come back. So I know some Think Tree members that are listening today with businesses such as Holistic Therapies, where it's important to be in a room with a client and being able to touch them, that you've been badly affected by lockdown. And my questions to you would be, have you been able to maintain a relationship with your clients? Have you been able to keep a high profile on social media? Um, or have you chosen to take some time out and have a bit of a break? Have you given promotional incentives so that people will return to your post lockdown? 
or have you decided to change and pivot your business? And certainly for me, the idea of this kind of thing on Zoom has been a change and a pivot for me because I'd much rather meet people face to face. But at a time when you can't do that, how do you get around that situation? Have you perhaps decided you were working too many hours? And pre, uh, post COVID now, as we head into that, that period, you've perhaps got um, a view that you're going to scale things down and perhaps work a little less and take more care of yourself. I saw um, an advert for Boots last week on TV. Um, I'm not being paid, by the way, by Tesco's or Boots. I don't know why I mentioned them by name. But it was a Boots advert on TV and they were talking about how they'd reinvented themselves um, during lockdown. And they'd come up with and designed lots and lots of new products for their customers. And I would say that perhaps now is a really good time for reinvention. Um, and for some people, they might think, well, it's a great idea. Yes, we'll have some more products or we'll create some uh, more services. But for others, it may be a bit dis disconcerting um, because actually when we're talking about reinvention, we can all also talk about ourselves. Um, so have you started thinking about reinventing yourself as we come out of lockdown? And to perhaps put a, um, a more personalised question to you, I would ask you today, are you the best that you can be? Are you the real authentic you in everything you do in your personal life and in your professional life? And if not, have you considered reinventing yourself and would you be prepared to do that? The previous presenter was talking about clients who had to be prepared to invest the time and energy in the thing that she was supporting them with. So if you aren't the best you can be currently and you feel perhaps you're not fully in the authentic you and who you want to be, perhaps now's a really good time to have a think about that and work out who you are and who you want to be moving forward. So this presentation might go in a slightly different direction now to what you were expecting, because I'm not going to immediately focus and talk about putting customers first. I will talk them about them a little later, but what I really want to focus on now is you. And my next question is this. Who are you? I think it's really important that we acknowledge the connection that we have with ourselves before we think about any other connections at all and our physical and our mental health are reliant um, and our well-being are reliant on the relationship we have with ourselves and how we feel about who we are the first presenter uh, this morning was a doctor who who was talking about self-talk which is something that's on my little list of things to speak about and what he was saying about the importance of positive self-talk in your head really resonates with me um, because I can be very, very good at worrying myself within 30 seconds of, of um, feeling I'm not good enough or I'm not qualified enough or I don't know enough um, and feeling a little bit inferior. So self-talk can be really, really damaging. And I remember when I was at school and studying maths, I didn't like maths, particularly I was in the top group, so clearly I could do maths. But in my head, I didn't think I could. And even as I got into my 30s and my 40s, I would say at work and in a professional capacity, oh, I'm rubbish at maths. And one day my manager took me to one side and she said, you run a massive department with a multi-million pound budget and you run that budget. How can you be rubbish with maths? And that woke me up and made me think. And even now in my 50s, if somebody talks to me about maths or I see an occasion when I need to I have a little bit of a panic inside but I quickly turn that around and say to myself actually you can do it it's not so hard don't talk yourself down so talking to yourself in a supportive way and treating yourself kindly is really really important because negative self-talk is hugely damaging and perhaps sometimes that comes from a place of you don't feel you're important enough to be listened to. And you don't really understand who you are as a person. So do, do you trust yourself? If your gut feeling tells you not to do something 
or that you're feeling nervous about a person perhaps by your side and you're not quite sure what they're going to do next and so on and you think perhaps you should walk away from them do you trust that gut feeling do you take notice of it because lots of people don't lots of people never even consider that but I've discovered over the years that my gut feeling is rarely wrong so that's the kind of thing about your body your brain working together and learning to understand and respect the gut feeling you have learning to respect yourself enough to have positive self-talk and belief in yourself because if you don't believe in yourself why would anybody believe in you um, and as I mentioned already with Rosemary I am a trustee of the meditation center in Dent in Cumbria uh, which is in the northwest of the UK for anyone who's listening from a different country and We've already talked a lot of the sessions today about how hugely helpful mindfulness and meditation is. The key thing for me was it taught me how to breathe properly. When we're nervous, we start breathing from here rather than from the diaphragm. And then we get a little bit panicky because we're breathing quickly. And so what meditation and mindfulness taught me was breathe properly, slowly, deeply, it only takes three deep breaths and I'm calm. So clearly breathing is hugely powerful. And when um, you're dealing with customers, for example, in um, a difficult situation, if they're complaining, for example, if you're a bit panicky and you're not breathing properly, they're going to be able to read that and they're going to tell you you're not confident in how you're responding to them. So being able to be calm, breathe, think slow or think quickly, but speak slowly. That's a really positive, useful skill to have. And thinking about your authentic self, what does that mean? Well, I think in psychological terms, I think it has a very specific meaning, but I, I'm not a psychologist and I can't claim to be an expert in that field. But to me, being authentic, it's all about what you say in, in your life, personal and professional life, aligns with your actions. When that happens, other people understand the kind of person that you are and they soon decide whether you're reliable and trustworthy. Because if you're saying things that then are not being backed up by actions, are they going to trust you? So part of the journey to ensure that you live and breathe your authentic self is actively thinking about your personal values and beliefs and actively considering your morals and thinking about your behaviours, in, particularly in difficult situations. And spending a little time considering your basic values and beliefs will really help you in the quest to become the real you. And I do actually have an online course, which I'll link you to later towards the end. Um, which will talk you through how to do this because a lot of people say to me well I, I don't know what my values and beliefs are how am I supposed to find out and my course can just help you do that by asking the right questions I think um, one of the things that's allowed me to grow into my authentic self is the decision to go self-employed so in 2014 i had been working or I'd been employed full-time for almost 30 years so the idea of self-employment was scary and exciting in equal measure. One of the aspects I love is the freedom that it offers me to be me. Now, it hasn't been an easy ride. It isn't an easy ride. And it hasn't made me a millionaire, but it has allowed me to choose what work I accept and what I don't accept. And that means I can choose work that aligns with my values. And this is where the heart image on the screen comes from. I'd be financially better off if I just allowed myself to undertake any old work. But if I don't agree with it, I won't do it. And if I'd let my head rule, instead of letting my heart rule on this one, I'd have been fully employed now, hugely stressed, probably ill, and quite possibly I might not even be here anymore. So the decision to be self-employed at the time was quite brave. As I say, it hasn't made me rich wealth in, in money wise but it's made me rich in personal happiness and well-being and so I'm so pleased that I allowed my heart to lead in that decision whilst acknowledging that one has to earn some money in order to pay the bills but I'm fine with not being a millionaire 
because I've chosen to live a more sustainable life. And I want to now use fewer resources and help save our planet and do my bit. The third image on the screen that you can see is a tree. Now I love using trees um, in, in talks and presentations and training that I do. This particular tree is representative of how I feel about myself and my roles in both family and career. And, and you might find it resonates with you too. So when I was director of a, a huge faculty in a big college, I felt like the roots of the tree. And I felt I needed to be strong all the time, keeping the tree steady, even in a howling gale of underfunding and constantly changing demands and priorities. And everyone who's ever worked in education will understand what I mean by that. The trunk was made up of my deputies who all headed up their own individual departments. And then the branches were the staff teams, the leaves were the students and the blossoms were the students' achievements. So, okay, the picture might be a bit fanciful, but it, it works for me. And I was happy being the roots of that tree, but it was also a hugely stressful and exhausting experience. And actually one of the presenters this afternoon was talking about burnout. And I'm able to understand and acknowledge now that, that what happened to me really in that role was I burnt out from complete exhaustion and a huge amount of stress. So that gave me an opportunity to venture into self-employment. And I realized I still wanted to be that tree, but I wanted to work in a different way. So I listened to our mental and physical health and listened to my inner voice. And that communicated what I wanted and what I needed. And I'm really glad I did that because that became the start of a very different journey. But what I was able to do was utilize decades of knowledge and experience to do things on my terms. So listening to my inner self, telling me and guiding me and advising me what to do, that, that strong connection that we all have with ourselves is really important because it impacts on our choices and it impacts on how we interact with other people. And if we want to connect effectively with our clients, then communication really is key. And I quite like this image because immediately what sprang to my mind was, we're not computers, we're human beings. We've got values, we've got beliefs, as we've just mentioned. We've also got opinions and emotions, which complicates things even further. In fact, these are the kind of things that advertisers tap into all the time to sell us things that we don't want. And of course, many of them are very well convincing us to, to buy things we don't need. If you know your values and you've started living those values, then actually you can choose to not fall for the hype. And you can recognize it as such. So if you've got concerns about the planet, for example, and climate change, you can choose to ignore the pressure to have a new car or a computer or a new phone or a bigger house or to have your garden tarmacked for parking three cars and putting decking everywhere and allowing no green space. You can make choices not to buy into that. And you can learn to decode the messages from advertisers who are bombarding you with all these messages such as you're mean or you're unfashionable or if you don't buy this, you don't care for your children, etc. etc. Now you might be thinking, but what on earth has all this got to do with my relationship with my clients? And what I would say is that how you communicate and what you communicate is the difference between having a strong, loyal client base and committed staff and having nothing, which is really relevant now when businesses have been such, through such a difficult time during periods of lockdown in the pandemic. So let's think about effective communication and what it is. Now, I do love this image, the, the head and the heart. We've been talking about me using my heart in choosing self-employment. Um, there does have to be some balance there. And the image with the seesaw shows that sometimes the heart will be more in control and sometimes the head more in control. And that's absolutely fine, as long as you're aware of, of the necessity for that. We need to think about using our heads whenever we're communicating with each other. And the reason for that is communicating through the heart's fine, 
but actually communicating using your head can minimise misunderstandings. And it can also ensure that we don't get taken advantage of, which can be very, very easy when you're a new small business. So the words I've listed on the screen here suggest some behaviours and some actions to think about in order to be able to communicate effectively. And I'll just give you a moment to read them. So areas such as body language, they've become much harder, haven't they? Because they're relevant in every single interaction we have, but when we've all been Zooming for months and months, we realise that body language actually is harder to read on a screen. Um, lots of nonverbal communication though happens in every single interaction. And so it's easier in real life to notice facial expressions or the amount of eye contact and tone of voice, that can be hard to judge online, whether somebody's breathing quickly, or what is their body posture and their movement. They can all be difficult to see accurately on screen. Ensuring clarity of information and checking your understanding and the understanding of your client is hugely important. And even if you're on the screen, if you're mindful of your tone of voice, your gestures, like I'm always using my hands, gestures, um, thinking about your body language, not slouching, not looking bored, not yawning, all of those kinds of things that are obvious. If you think about that, and then when you're communicating with customers or clients, you ensure absolute clarity of information and remember to check understanding. So ask, ask a question, ask, to make sure that your client knows what it is you're offering them, for example, if you're agreeing something through a verbal contract. Because if your client hears one thing and you think there's another thing that you're supposed to be delivering, there will be a fallout at some point. So being respectful as well is also a hugely important communication skill. And sometimes when people feel really passionate about things, that can be quite hard, especially if you think that what the other person is saying or asking for, if they're a customer, is over the top or not appropriate. So remembering to stay calm, to breathe, to be respectful of that person as another human being, that will pay dividends in avoiding conflict. And actually, if somebody is making a complaint, for example, Another skill that I've, well, I'm still learning, if I'm absolutely truthful, is not to interrupt. Because sometimes if a client's complaining or it looks as if they're trying to start an argument, if you start interrupting or you start challenging back immediately, what happens is that that escalates. And if you make a conscious decision to let that client verbalize how they feel, tell you what the problem is from their point of view, Firstly, it gives you a little time to think about what your response might be, but also more importantly, it gives you the time and the space to listen to what the client is saying and to hear what they're saying. And the decision to, not to interrupt is a really powerful one, actually. Um, I don't know if anyone's come across um, Nancy Klein and the thinking environment. Um, I'm just reading her latest book at the moment, which is summing up with 30 years of, of research into this. And, and all of the thinking environment is about better thinking develops from the fact that we recognize and allow each other to speak and be heard without interruption. And often that happens in a circle where you go around and individually people speak and nobody but nobody interrupts. The first few times you try it, it's really quite hard. And I found it so difficult the first time I tried it. What it taught me was I interrupted people a lot. And actually, it's just really rude, isn't it, to interrupt people a lot? So I've learned that lesson. And now I consciously think, I consciously make myself listen and stay calm and try not to judge. And that's a really powerful behavior. And then the client that you're talking to, feels heard and feels valued in that interaction. And if you can do that, actually, you're more likely to achieve the outcome that you want. 
the effectiveness of the method of communication as well um, does impact on what's communicated. So again, if there's shouting happening, the person you're shouting at is not listening. Absolutely, 100% guaranteed they're not listening. They're thinking about what they're going to say next or rather what they're going to shout next. So take that deep breath, listen to your clients if they have a problem or an issue, hear what they're saying and then think through, give yourself time and a pause to think through what the solution might be. In the context of a virtual meeting like this one, just imagine there might be 10 people on a Zoom call um, and you've got a dodgy Wi-Fi signal. So there the method of communication and its effectiveness is being affected by that Wi-Fi signal. Now just imagine something really important is being discussed and the screen freezes just momentarily. What happens then is that the message becomes distorted between the, everybody else in the meeting and you because your screen's frozen. And if at some point in the few words that you've missed, the word not has appeared, then that could have enormous implications, couldn't it? It's a tiny word, but it could be easily missed in a faulty connection for a few seconds. And that might send you off doing exactly the wrong thing that you've been instructed to do because you've missed the word not. So it's worthwhile double checking, particularly when you're online, to make sure that you haven't misunderstood or misheard something really important. So connecting with your client, in my view, one of the most effective ways to do it well is to be the real authentic you. Be clear about who you are, and that's both in personal and professional life. It's online and it's in person. And of course, everything that we ever put online stays online and stays visible. So it's really important that you think about that when you're posting on whatever social media you use. Always be transparent about your products and services. Don't try to con your clients because that's not going to end well. So be honest and truthful and transparent. If you do employ staff, treat them well. Try to be the best boss, the best manager, the best leader that you can be. Try to be the best in the industry, even if you only have four people employed and you have a small business. That doesn't mean that you can't be the one that everybody wants to come and work for by the way you treat your staff. And be absolutely 100% genuine and honest in all your interactions. Because what happens then is, if you start lying to clients, you have to have a good memory to remember what you've said. Be honest, and then the client is never in a position where they're going to catch you out because you're telling fibs. So work out who you are, be genuine, be honest, and be transparent. And to use myself as an example here, I'm on all sorts of social media. I am a bit of a social media um, or a technological dinosaur, to be honest. Uh, and I think that is age related. When I grew up, we didn't have computers in schools. Um, but I've done my best to catch up and I'm on LinkedIn and Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. Um, you can find my website. Um, you can go and see what I've got on there. It's not perfect by any means but it illustrates who I believe I am. It, it illustrates the person that I aim to be, I want to be publicly and who I genuinely feel I am. Uh, and Rosemary mentioned uh, at the beginning, um, my interest, uh, perhaps we call it a bit of an obsession with ethical leadership. And that does feature quite strongly on my website. And there's lots of uh, biographical and career information, the types of training I offer, the work I do, both paid and unpaid. There are my blogs there, client testimonials, all of those things paint a picture of who I am. And as a small business owner, I would expect that you would have something similar and you'll have your business website on there. Be absolutely clear about what you stand for. And what that ensures is that you find the right kind of people to be your customers. And to me, that matters. So if you read my website, for example, and some of my blogs and think, yeah, she's, she's the kind of person I'd like to work with, or she's the kind of person I'd, I'd love her to be my coach to help me deal with one or two difficulties I'm having at work. Fantastic. Drop me an email, give me a call, and let's arrange to have a meeting. If you read the stuff I put in the public domain and think, oof, don't like the sound of her, 
um, I'm quite put off by the things she's writing, the things she's sharing, and that's fine. It's absolutely fine. What you would need to do is to find the right person to work with you. Because whilst you, I might not be the right person to be your coach, for example, you might not be the right person to be one of my clients. So now we'll think about connection. And we have another 10 bullet points here about achieving a good connection as a connection. And as we've said, um, it can be harder to do when you're not physically in the room. So today I can't see anybody on screen. There could be nobody out there apart from Rosemary. And that's a bit of a challenge. Um, so it's easier if you're in the room, it's easier if you can pick up on an audience and an atmosphere. But this slide shows what I think is the key to connecting effectively with others. And I have been trying hard to do all of these things while I've been talking to you during this session. So I'll just give you a few seconds to read those bullet points. The second bullet point, um, actively listening to learn. We've already talked a little bit about, a bit about listening to others. And active listening, particularly online, can be really exhausting. Um, and the listener can quickly lose focus. As we've said about the dodgy Wi-Fi, if that happens, then part of the message being communicated is lost. So working hard as a manager, leader or a business owner, Working hard on your listening skills is really important because then you can hear both what your staff are telling you and also what your clients, customers are telling you. And you can establish more easily what it is they want and need. And of course, as the doctors and therapists who've been on earlier today would probably say, what a client actually is telling you and what they want to need, it might be very difficult, very different, uh, pardon me, very different to what they're actually saying via the words they're using. And I'm sure that you've all got examples from professional experiences where that's true. And the person either hasn't wanted to say what's really wrong or hasn't been able to. And it's up to you then as the specialist to, to work out what it is they really do need. I think in a fast moving world sometimes, those qualities that you can see on screen at the moment, they can be forgotten about and they can be lost in the hubbub of daily life. And you know, how many times have you told a, a friend or a family member in the past that you don't have time for them because work's calling and you, you've got to, got to crack on? Um, I, I did it actually earlier today with a family member who rang me and I said, oh, I can't talk now, I'm on, a, I'm on an event all day. And I'm, <laughs> And actually, when I hung up, I was aware that I was going to be saying this this afternoon and it did jar with me a little because I wanted to have that conversation. But what I thought was, actually, I'll ring that person later. So although I couldn't speak just then, I will give them my time later this evening, obviously before the football match. Um, so thinking about the impact on your business of COVID, I think the lockdowns and the limitations that, that we've been working under um, have given people a place to stop and think about what they're doing and, and a place to understand how interdependent we are on each other. So things like on the screen you can see um, showing empathy and being understanding and being grateful. If you use those um, behaviours in your professional life as well as your personal life you will benefit from that you will feel more positive having a kinder approach not focusing all the time on sell 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 actually listen 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 and what you will get perhaps is different behaviors from your customers and your clients I'm going right back to the first point I've jumped about a little bit on this slide haven't I the genuine interest one I think that is really important, especially for people like therapists and um, medical people who have to perhaps quickly develop a relationship with a client. Um, that's one where they trust you. There is a relationship of trust there. 
if you can develop a, a genuine connection quite quickly, that does inspire confidence and it inspires loyalty. And that's when if you follow up with an excellent product or service, they will come back. I can think of an example where I did some proofreading work for a university professor and um, I returned it very, very quickly and she was very shocked. And her first response was just to say, oh, I'll recommend you to all my colleagues. And then she said, yeah, can I write a testimonial for you? Which, and I wasn't expecting really either of those things, but because I'd done a good job and I delivered it very quickly, she'd, which I'd said I could do because she was on a tight deadline, what she'd experienced was me sort of doing what it said on the tin. I said, yes, I can get it back to you in a couple of days. Yes, it will be done properly and in depth. And I delivered. And she came back to me the next time she needed some um, proofreading doing. I was um, a head of department at a college as an interim manager and I went there for four months and after a week I was hugely enthusiastic and very fired up when I got there it was a really exciting new challenge and I'd been there a week when the assistant principal said um, would I accept the permanent role that was on offer and I, I thought for a few minutes and, and then said no because at that point in my career, I didn't want to do that anymore. I decided I wanted the freedom of being self-employed. It actually took some doing to say no or walking away from the potential stability of that role. But what I also understood in that transaction was it was important for me to be authentic and honest and have integrity in how I said no, because there was a risk that that assistant principal would think that in some way I thought badly of the college or the staff. And they may have misinterpreted my reasons for saying no. It was a fantastic college, but I had put effort, even in that first week, into identifying um, how I needed to behave with particular people and building good interpersonal relationships very, very quickly. So she accepted that I was going to be leaving and I'd help and support her in finding somebody else to come and take over. Um, but if you can behave in this way with clients, then your relationships will blossom and they will trust you. And from that trust comes recommendation and further clients. So give others your time, learn about them, care about them, act with integrity, be interested in their needs and those relationships will strengthen. And you just have to think about an occasion in your life, personally or professionally, where there have been problems in, in your family, say, with communication. What caused that, that breakdown of communication and what were the consequences of that? And then if you look at your own behaviours and your own reactions, then are there some repeated behaviours? And then are there some repeating results? Because you're behaving in a certain way which other people don't like and they respond to in a negative way. So the re reactions that your behavior is eliciting others, um, if you can identify them and see what you can change and how you can improve that, that, that can be really helpful in avoiding future conflicts. Remember, it's important to stick to your word with clients and customers. If you promise something and you don't deliver, then they're going to tell everybody about that. You're going to get negative reviews all over social media. They will have no confidence with you and they're not going to come back. So just before I move on to my next slide, I do hope that point 10 on here uh, says smile. And I hope you noticed that on the previous slide, it also said the same thing. Because a smile, as long as it's a genuine one and your eyes are smiling too, can just give you a few seconds to pause and think about a response and a smile and a friendly demeanor makes other people relax in your company and is so important so finally now we're just going to get on to the next slide which is about your clients ask who they are and what their wants and needs are so as i've already mentioned i don't think your focus should ever be on selling your product or service um, to your clients. And I think it should be about getting to know their needs and demonstrating that genuine interest. So all those years I spent teaching and managing and leading people, in my view, the best way to do that is to make sure you get to know every individual 
as much as you can and as much as they will allow because of course in a workplace some people are more private than others but if you get to know each individual then you can make sure that you as their manager or their boss provide what it is they need to perform at the highest level possible if you've um, never had the experience of working in a team or having to bring together a new team um, and never been on a corporate away day I highly recommend, even if you're a small business and you've got six employees, I highly recommend things like away days because what you can learn about people in maybe five hours can be a phenomenal amount of information. And I'll never forget when I had to build a new team with lots of um, staff coming together from different departments that we went on an away day and I discovered that one of my colleagues had the competitive instinct that you might look for in an Olympic athlete. I didn't know him well at all, but I found myself in a canoe with him in the middle of a lake and we were in a canoe race. And that's the moment that I discovered his competitive nature because losing was not an option. And those kind of things that take people out of their normal working environment and give them new challenges, you can really, really gel as a team and you can really work out what makes people tick. What happened that afternoon was really memorable. I learned a lot about a lot of people. And years later, the guy in the canoe, we remain good friends, even though we haven't worked with each other for years. And we now actually work together as charities, charities, as trustees of a local charity that we set up. So let's think about how you show your clients that you genuinely care about them. And I would ask a couple of questions. Do they feel valued? Do they feel important? When they ring you, when they text you, when they email you, do they get through to you? Do they get through to one of your staff? Is it a real person that they get through to? Or is it an automated service? Do they get through to an answering service, which is completely impersonal and makes them feel like they're being processed? Do they get through to a message that says, oh, we'll ring you back, but then nobody ever rings them back? So if you remember back to one of our previous slides, it talked about treating others as you want to be treated. And I'm sure there isn't anybody listening to this call that isn't hugely irritated when they've been trying to um, get in touch with the company day after day after day and they can't actually get to speak to a human being. So remember the importance of treating others as you want to be treated. And although the service or product that you provide is about them, how you deliver it is entirely about you and what you think is important. So actually, in my, again, it's my personal view, if your clients just feel like they're being processed, then the message that they could be taking away is that they're of no value and they don't matter to you. And if you're thinking right now, well, actually, yeah, we could probably improve in some of these areas, then some of the things I would ask are, do you, have consistent quality standards? Do you have a mission statement for your business that goes above and beyond what required industry standards ask for? Do you welcome customer feedback? Do you ask for it? And then do you listen to it and act upon it? Do you respond quickly and kindly to complaints or to any issues? And do you always lead by example and model appropriate, polite, professional behavior at all times? because that as well when you're leading a team, however small or large the team is, can be difficult. I remember some years ago as a head of department, um, one of my staff who worked in an office outside me, she, she regularly would bring me a cup of coffee when I'd come back from a meeting and gone into my office. And we well, she'd been doing this a couple of years. And one day she said, oh, oh I always know when you've got a bad meeting. And that's actually quite mortifying. And I said, really? And she sort of looked at me and said, well, yes, I can just tell from your body language. Um, so be aware that what you're saying isn't the only message that your clients are picking up. I, I was mortified that day when I realised that I was coming out of meetings, perhaps feeling very stressed. And it was having an impact on other people in my office, the office that I had to, to walk through up to the point where a colleague felt they needed to come and bring me a drink it was only coffee um 
So lead by example and model appropriate behaviours at all times. And if you've got something, you know, please do feel free to put in the chat if you've got a, a suggestion of something you use that works well in supporting you to behave well and be a good role model for your teams, please do, do share it in the chat. So, my thoughts about learning and training, and a lot of you who are in various um, holistic therapies and medical professions and things like that, you, you already know about this already, we never stop learning. But what I would ask for you today is to learn from today to perhaps take a different approach to delivering to your clients and thinking about you and what you're giving of yourself to your clients and, and what that adds to their experience as opposed to it just being an off the shelf purchase that they're making. So what you're doing with your clients is you are offering a product or a service that is all about them but who you are is absolutely key to the experience they get out of it. Keep listening and learning from your clients, from um, other people who work in your field. And think about as you're going through your life and learning and developing, think about what your purpose is and whether you're fulfilling it. Because what I learned when I went self-employed was I needed an element of freedom to fulfill what I believe to be my purpose in life. And actually, I just want to share this book with you. It's um, by a guy called Richard Jacobs. It's called What's Your Purpose? This is a very old copy. This is from 2004. And it was a book that I bought in 2004. And I read all the way through and I wrote down what I thought my purpose was. I found this book uh, two weeks ago when I was having a sort out of the bookshelf. And some bits of paper fell out. And on the bits of paper, I had written what I thought my purpose was. And what I had written was that I want, this is 15 years ago, that I wanted to be confident, nurturing, fair, inspirational, and an enabler serving the purpose of helping others to develop and achieve their potential. And actually, I think my sister would probably say I've actually been working on that purpose since I was about five. Um, so if that's about 50 years in total. But I think when I, as a young child, was obsessed about fairness and doing the right thing, I think what I've been doing is building on and developing that purpose to today when I've got the freedom to do things like this and to tell people on my 35 years worth of experience and expertise what I think I can offer to you that might make you think in a different way and may very well work to make your businesses potentially more successful and change the relationship the way you think about your, your customers and your clients. So will you change anything after this session today? Have you ever thought about what your purpose is? Or have you always just thought about, oh, I'll get a job and I'll earn some money and I'll pay the bills? Because we're very emotional creatures as human beings and I think we've all got a purpose on this planet and I would encourage you to find out what yours is and if you're doing a job but you don't really feel quite comfortable in it it could be because that's actually not what your purpose is so I mentioned a little while ago um, one of the course or well, generally courses that I offer I do workshops and coaching but I have got a course online which is hosted by Think Tree Hub and it's a real mouthful it's called make self-development your superpower and that's through the lens of ethical leadership and if you say well actually I'm not a leader because I don't employ any staff you actually are because you lead yourself and in all our behaviors and in all our interactions we have to lead ourselves so that course actually looking at the lens of ethical leadership and what that does is it also asks you about your values and your beliefs and your moral outlook on life and those kind of things. So when we were talking earlier on in the session about values and beliefs, this is a course and it's on 50% discount at the moment. It's the massive amount of money, a total of £12 for the course. And what that does is it gives you the information you need to start looking into and thinking about what your morals and values are in life. Um, and those people who've taken it, I know I've enjoyed it, found it really useful. 
and actually it guides you on a journey of self-discovery. So you can work out your values and beliefs. You can look after yourself in a kind and caring way. And hopefully it can help to start you on the journey of fulfilling your purpose. So I've come to the end. I'm not sure how long that took, probably longer than Rosemary was expecting. Um, so I do believe that when you're happy in your life and healthy in your life, and you're happy and healthy in your work and you feel fulfilled that you are more happy, more likely to have happy clients. If you're miserable as sin, why on earth would your clients be happy by dealing with you? So really, that's that's my last word, Rosemary. I am going to shut up. My website is, I think, somewhere visible on this screen. Yeah, it is. Um, and, and I think the Meditation Centre website, is that also mentioned there? It's on your screen, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it right? Okay, I can't see because of the, the other things on there. Okay, so I will now just stop sharing and come back into the room. I'm sorry, I've overrun, haven't I? Oh, Josie, how terrible. Are you apologising? You see, that's something you should learn to do less. Yeah, that's that's one of my things. I apologise far too often. I'm not sorry, really, because I've loved it. So actually, let's be honest and authentic. I've loved it. And it's still before 4.30. 5.30. 5.30. Even 5.30. It's all right, I got all the times mixed up. <laughs> oh, oh, goodness. Do you know, actually, I, 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 I've got some thing. I, if, if I can say it, if I can say it, Josie. You know, when you're saying about the lady who brought you coffee, I just think how lovely that she could read you and was caring about you and valued you so much as a leader that she'd do that for you. Well, actually, yes, that's reframing the, I think, I think, yes, you're right. And I think now looking back, I perhaps would interpret it like that at the time because I was stressed. Yeah. Of course, the way I saw it was, oh, oh, I must be a rubbish boss because she's worked out that I'm stressed and I'm trying to protect them from all the stress. So. I saw it as a weakness. Isn't that, isn't, isn't, isn't that? And you know, and then you go, well, where did I learn that behaviour? Christine's just said, thank you, Josie. I got really got a lot out of this session. Oh, you're welcome, yeah. Christine. Oh, nice. Yeah, it, it is like, where did I learn the behaviour? Where did I learn that I must protect other people from stress? And that's the kind of thing you really, you know, begin begin to reflect on the, the, the sort of the patterns and the, the, the ways of behaviour and who we learn them from. And how we accept them as an all, how we accept that it's okay to be completely and utterly stressed. And oh, Jane's buying my course. <laughs> Thank you, Jane. I hope you'll enjoy it. Do let me know. It is interesting, and of course, our behaviours all come from experiences yeah. in life. And I was talking to my oldest school friend we met when we were four, four and a half, on our first day at school, and. You know we're still in touch now and a few years ago um i was talking about this kind of thing and she just said well you've always been a leader mm. and, I, and i said oh, oh, have i and she said well don't you remember she said when i was bullied at school and, and you stood up to the school bully on the bus going home and i couldn't even remember that but to her that had obviously had such an impact on her life we were 10 years old at the time and she said, I've never forgotten that. She said, and I knew I'd always got a friend who'd look after and protect me. And so somehow you absorb these things by osmosis, don't you? And they become part of who you are. And that's why the maths thing, that saying I'm rubbish at maths, I've had to work really, really hard because I thought it for so long and believed it for so long. And it's taken a lot of reprogramming. Yeah. Think, Actually, I can do it. And yeah, that was probably a, a, a kind of some offhand comment by a teacher or or by a, by another pupil at school that you took to heart when you were probably five or six mm -hmm. that, that's yeah. that's the madness of it and that those yeah. those are the the, the things that, that as um are pernicious and that we we kind of have to decide well we don't have to decide but i mean it's, if it's sensible if we don't yeah. want to carry more baggage than normal Yes, and you need to allow yourself space in your head, don't you? That's the thing. 
Mm -hmm. And when you're highly stressed, and all those are the presenters that have been talking about this throughout the day, yeah. when you're so stressed and your head is so full, it can't. And obviously then you're going to fight and flight and all of that just to protect yourself. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I've, you know, I've got to my mid fifties <laughs> before some of this has fallen into place. And what I've realized now is I am my own boss. So I'll just say what I think, but it comes from a place that's educated and informed and lived experience. So I view myself as a sort of leadership practitioner. That's how I kind of think of where I'm coming from. So today, yeah. some of the speakers, you know, are doctors and things, you know, and I, I don't pretend to, to be a doctor or a psychiatrist, but I can have some thoughts from lived experience that I've then gone and researched. Um, and that's, yeah, and people, it seems to work. People seem to, I feel privileged that people listen to what I say um, and such as the, the course, do the course, and they'll send me the little personalised action plan at the end for comments. And, you know, they make some lovely remarks about what they've learned and the lady who's commented in the chat saying she's learned a lot. I mean, that, you know, that sort of helps and supports me, doesn't it? And it fe feeds my need to want to be of use to other people in helping them. So, so, and I need to thank you, Rosemary, for inviting me to be part of, of today. I've really, really enjoyed it. It's been fantastic. Oh, it's been, I think we've had, had some really great talks and, you know, people can obviously watch bits that have missed or whatever. Um, but, but there is such a consistent message coming through. You know, you've, you've watched all day. Well, I have watched all day and it's fascinating because I knew what I was going to say long before I watched all day. Yeah. Every single person, what they've said, something, the exact words of some of what they've said were in what I planned to say. Yeah. So that shows, doesn't it, that there's a certain approach um, that can help and support, particularly with mental health and well-being, um, but also physical to some degree. Um, and you know, to hear the doctors that have been talking and then the therapists that have been talking about it. And again, that then helps you not suffer from a lack of confidence in your own experience, because actually other professionals are saying, well, actually, yes, this is the case. Exactly. So, yeah, I found it really, really valuable the whole day and I've loved being able to, to present. Oh, we've loved having you, Josie. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Can I go and have a glass of wine now, or is it too early? Yeah, no, it's not too early to have a glass of wine. <laughs> well, that's what I'm going to do. Well, I'll, I'll go make myself a herb tea. I have, I have herb tea perhaps today. I, perhaps I will. Perhaps I'll do that first, and I'll save the wine for the Tour de France that's... highlights, I think. That's Are you cool. watching the Tour de France? Oh, yes, love it, love it. Yes, absolutely. Well, I love France. Uh, we go on holiday there quite regularly um, and oh we did do um so yeah we love picking out the places that we've been and the cafes that we had a drink <laughs> to go riding past and i'm always amazed at their mental and physical discipline and, mm. and fitness it's just well in my thoughts almost beyond compare because of all the different, you think of all the muscles that have to be used up mountains and downhills and fast roads. And oh, it's a, a, what what those riders achieve is just unbelievable. I mean, the, the, the endurance that, you know, the guy, sorry for going off topic, everyone, but you know, <laughs> the guy, who was it? He literally kept, fell off a bike, dislocated his shoulder, yeah. had somebody put his shoulder back in, got straight on the bike and pedaled off. I think it was Geraint Thomas that, wasn't it? Was it? I, I, I don't know. Or well, the guy who wrote, rode with a broken pelvis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's... You yeah, know. It, is, it is unbelievable. It is unbelievable. But I do, I enjoy watching it for the sport, but I enjoy the scenery as well. So, mm. Yeah, so. and I, I mean, even riding in a peloton is such a skill. Mm -hmm. Such an incredible skill. Yeah, it is. It is, yeah. Yeah, and it's so hugely technical. It's taken me about five years to learn <laughs> how that actually all works. But lockdown has been good for that because I've been able to watch the Welter and the Giro and all the things that perhaps I wouldn't have done before. So, see, I've learned a new, a new skill there, learning how to read a peloton. <laughs> Who'd have thought it? <laughs> Who'd have thought it? I mean, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, 
Well, I'm, I'm going to call it to end because your glass or cup of something is calling and and, uh, and so is mine. And thank you so much to Jane. Thank you so much to everyone who's listened today or who will see it in the future. Um, enjoy. Absolutely. Thank you. Bye bye, everybody. Bye. bye.